Uh, all right, we're going to get started as, as Danny passes out water. Uh, welcome to International Trends in Small Press Publishing. And we have uh, an extremely distinguished panel of um, publishers, new and old, of various sizes and scopes. Um, and from uh, my left to right, we have Carter Lumiere with Disquette Press, Annie Koyama, Koyama Press. May I take your picture? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to type every one of you. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, uh, Mark Pearson of Glom Press. And uh, also, I also want to actually, that's one of the notes, uh, countries of origin, part of from America, uh, Amy from Canada, Mark from Australia. And then we have two publishers and editors from Denmark. Uh, we have uh, uh, Paul Matthijsen from uh, Fahrenheit. And we have um, uh, Pernilla Arvidsson from uh, Kohl. Um, so, first question, and uh, the general format of how I'm going to do this is I'm going to ask a few leading questions, uh, but also uh, whenever any of you has questions of each other, wants to interject, please go ahead and do so. It's really here to kind of nudge things along a little bit. And kind of an introductory question is, what led you to want to publish and edit comics, and in particular, Art comics, underground comics, that sort of thing. Uh, what is what leads you to this journey to to, the, to make this much of an effort to do this thing? And we'll start with Carta, and we'll go down the line. Um, well, I had been self-publishing comics for a number of years, although like I'm still I still feel like the the freshman in the the room at, at a comics convention. Um, and I stumbled into buying a risograph machine, um, the print shop where I had been um, publishing or printing my comics, knew that I was interested in risograph printing and they had one, like a dusty one sitting in a corner that they never wanted to plug in. And they called me a year after I went there um, and asked if I wanted to buy it and like six drums for something like $200, like something absurd. Um, and I said, yes, obviously I did. And so then I had a risograph machine in my house. And I felt like, well, if I'm going to have this, I might as well start printing my friends' books as well. You know, I'm putting in all of the effort to fix this thing and learn this thing that can print thousands of pages in an hour. You know, it's like uh, 120 pages per minute. Um, and so that was honestly like the impetus for me to start publishing was just having the means and knowing that like printing is expensive and like the people I'm friends with don't tend to have a lot of money um so it, it felt like a very natural fit I mean, normally in these conversations people don't actually talk about money that's really good that you brought that up because we were joking about way before I knew Carter in person she wrote to me and I think I discouraged her from getting into it and uh, <laughs> because you need that I wanted to be an art book publisher first the year I started, and I know nothing about publishing, I'm an avid reader, clearly, you know, I grew up with comics, but I never had this, I didn't really actually know what a publisher did back then, not that long ago as a film producer, so I knew how to organize and that kind of thing, but the year I decided to do it, the two big stores in Toronto that sold all the art books closed. So people were already not buying print stuff as all, well, and then they were, you know, tolling the bell for the end of print. But I like a challenge, clearly. <laughs> so I continued on with the art book stuff for a while, and then I discovered people like Michael DeForge, and then went right over to the dark side, and I remain there today. But I'm thrilled to have gone over to that side and thank many of the artists with whom I've worked for introducing me to you know, people like you, people like Karta, you know, some of you in the room, and new artists. So accidentally is my answer. Um, yeah, it's probably similar to Carter, yeah. but I just I stumbled on a risograph that was a um, that was printing like a Conservative Party uh, <laughs> <laughs> pamphlets and like propaganda. Oh, I'm talking very loud. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in in a different state in Australia, and then we kind of saved that machine, and now we just uh, print um, not the opposite of that. What well, yeah. <laughs> dominated, but the opposite. Of that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I also got a job as uh, drawing graphic medicine comics. Uh, kind of off the back of 
a collaborative project I'd done with some friends and I felt a lot of guilt for money off the back of a collaborative project, so I tried to pour that money back into another collaborative project, which was printing my, well, like people's work who I feel like didn't have the means to print their own work or weren't being asked when they should have been being asked or, yeah. I use dirty advertising money myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, 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 I guess mine's like kind of grabbing that some money's kind of weird yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. sorry, Tom. Yeah, sorry. No, no problem. Yeah. Um, I grew up with uh, a, f a daddy, a father, who was very interested in comics, so he gave the interest to me also. Uh, and he supported me when I was 13 years old, uh, that's 40 years ago, in 1979, um, to help me uh, editing and printing a small fan thing called Fat Comic. It was with the small cartoons and reviews, and uh, at that time he's now retired, but he worked as a jail officer in my hometown. And uh, <coughs> in the jail, while, while the, his colleagues uh, was raping the convicts in the bathroom, he stood in the Xerox copy room and the Xerox copies this little magazine for me. So that's how it started. and. Um, then it just grew and became bigger and bigger and started and 10 years after I started an anthology called Farnhard and then I started uh, doing uh, one shots and uh, today it's a publishing house that publish small press uh, kind of thing but actually also mainstream books like Craig Thompson and Charles Burns. Hello. Well, I come from a large publishing house in, in Danish terms, uh, but I'm working with the Danish comics, which is not a, a large market in Denmark, uh, so my motivation has two sides. Uh, traditionally, the, the Danish comic has not been edited that much. Uh, people were working on by themselves, uh, the artists, and then they come with 200, 300 pages, take it or leave it. So I, I want to change that um, tendency, uh, and and also I I, I really want to to uh, make the comic uh, reach a larger market. I want uh, more readers for comic books. That's my my main goal actually. <laughs> um, so for next question, um, I want to talk about asking, what are your personal and aesthetic? What's your personal aesthetic vision as a publisher and an editor? And with this, I'm going to uh, show some images for the sorts of things that each publisher shows. And uh, we'll go ahead and start with Annie. And this, of course, is a famous kick-ass Annie image. And we have some images from some recent books that I'll show. She's, she's talking, kind of demonstrated. But, um, and in sort of answering this question, I'm interested in the idea of whether or not you individually edit a book. Um, and I'm interested in what degree everyone does that. To what degree do you see simply the act of publishing something and act of editing the selection of something itself? So go ahead. I'll start. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, I'm very hands off in the editing. Um, I wasn't an editor by trade. I have my taste is. Everything I publish is predicated on my taste. It's probably funny. It might be body horror. It might uh, talk about depression and mental health. Uh, these things, except for maybe the body horror, a little bit of the body horror. I know these things personally, so they speak to me. You know, I understand if you talk about suicide, I, I understand about depression. Um, Kyla Roberts, for instance, is amazing. As in the time I've known her, She's become more and more ill each year, and that's why she's not actually at the show. But she continues making work, and she speaks to not just people who have children. Uh, I don't have any biological children that I know of. But she has, <laughs> she's got a great kid, and she's, she's hilarious, and she tells, she's that mom at the school meeting who will say, your kid is an asshole. <laughs> and everyone around is thinking that. They're looking at it and going, but why is someone not, you know, controlling that kid? And she will be going, your kid's an asshole. <laughs> so that very, it's 
it's endearing, if, unless maybe that was your kid, but it's very endearing. She's very frank, and she's the same way about her uh, bipolar condition, and also, you know, now she has MS, and um, it's not divulging anything. She talks about this in her book, and, you know, makes light of them, but there is an underlying, you know, very heavy, deep, you know, it's not a fun life but she's decided to make it relatable to us. And that is more admirable than, you know, I'm not a writer. It's hard for me to write when people do that well, and I think she does it extremely well. It, I just, there's nothing better. So I go with a very light editing hand. If you were to ask me to uh, edit down your book, I'll do a little bit, but I'm coming to you because I like your work already. I'm only gonna ask you to make the story shorter if it's not sustaining 17 pages worth, and it could be told in five. Aside from that, that's it really hands off. Mm -hmm. So speaking to the idea of like what you select and why, does it does everything you publish have to speak to you personally in some way? Pretty much. I have to like the art. I can't read books if I don't like the art. I, I can love the person. I you know, no that's I you know, I'll, I'll read it, I'll, I'll read to a certain part, but if I don't like the art, I, it's not gonna sustain me. I'm a very visual person. Uh, you know, after I had my brain surgery, people are like, you must be afraid of nothing now. And I said, you know, mostly that's true, but I do have a fear of, you know, if these get worse and I can't see stuff, if you're a visual person, that's sort of the biggest nightmare for me. So anyway, now you know my secret. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's yeah. a good thing this is your last SPX. Yeah, I know. Let's Ask me anything. Yeah, let's <laughs> we'll go ahead and move on to Carter next same question about um, personal aesthetic vision and also e editor as publisher. Yeah, um, I guess my goal, my press is called Disket Press, um, and my goal is very much to publish the people who might not have received as much attention. Um, we're at the show this year, we brought 18 different books. Um, and all of them were published by trans artists, and most of them had not been published by anyone else before. Um, the way that I see our press is very much as a stepping stone. Um, I try to be extremely generous in the way that I pay my artists, but at the same time, I'm not a big publisher. I'm not able to offer advances. Um, I'm not able to... Um, you know, give artists the same benefits as like a larger publisher and my distribution is quite limited. But within this community, I do have like some reach. And so it's important to me to be able to use that reach and that voice to give um, exposure and money to artists who might be considering comics, but like need that little push over the edge. Um, and also, I mean, I think it's worth mentioning like Everything we do is is done in my living room um, on a single risograph machine. Um, before a show, our living room is uninhabitable. It's just like all paper and like people collate every book by hand. I've probably touched every copy of every book that you know we give people. Um, so we don't have the capacity to do glossy, beautiful books the way that other publishers do. Um, and so I'm very interested in like doing what we can with what we have and making beautiful work with the the machines available to us like that's very important to me um in terms of editing i like to know what we're publishing you know like i i ask artists before they give me stuff like if you can get me a script or um you know like just let me know i've only had to like kill one book um and at this point like hopefully that that wouldn't happen again, but it's important to me that like I at least feel comfortable standing behind everything we publish, especially since like a lot of what we do is like personal narrative and trauma based stuff from like very marginalized artists and and I want to be able to go to bat for it if anybody ever has a problem with that um otherwise though, I'm not like super super hands on and I'm like um you know I'll do like type uh what's it called copy editing. But sometimes I'll leave typos in because I think they're nice. Also, you know, like um, we published the work of a 17 year old trans boy who I've known since he was 12 and he'd never had a published comic before. It's called My Issues of Being Transgender. And 
a lot of the writing is, you know, like, there's some misspellings and, like, the title doesn't, like, super flow. But, like, I also love it because it's completely earnest. And it's important to me to communicate that earnestness. Like, we are not glossy. We're doing, like, very bare bones kind of, like, I want you to read this work. Here's the best presentation I can give it. But I don't want to change it too much, if that makes sense. Um, without going into details, uh, what kind of decisions led you to like having to kill a book? Was it a fundamental? The the decision to kill a book was, I mean, I guess like Annie, what what I um, want to print is is things to my own taste. I mean, I think every publisher would say they want to print books to their own taste to some to some degree. And there was a book that, that just made me personally uncomfortable. Um, it was a personal narrative um, that involved uh, what I felt was the author like taking advantage of a younger person and like really not examining that in the book. And so it just made me too uncomfortable to, to feel that I would have to stand behind it because I didn't feel like I, I, I would feel good standing behind it. Um, so in that case, I mean, it was, it was partly my fault. I was just starting out, and like I hadn't given the artist a proper contract, and so I gave them a, a substantial kill fee for the work that they had done, and like tried to be very ethical about it. Um, and now, like I am very careful about like getting every artist a contract before we begin, and asking them to um, give me an idea of what they're working on and that kind of thing, because I I also don't want to leave artists in the lurch because I might have some personal problem with with something. Um, it wasn't like egregious. It wasn't like a criminal book. You know, it was just like a book I didn't feel super comfortable with. Understood. All right, let's go to Mark. Um, yeah, well, I wouldn't say with similarly hands off. I feel like I'm always drawn to, like, I feel like I have a very strong aesthetic uh, um, appreciation, but also I feel like I'm always, with comics, I'm always surprised, and I feel like the voice is always the thing that comes through uh, with comics that I like, and I'm always like, I'll read something that I think I won't like based on it visually, and then I'll be struck by the voice and the, um, the person behind it. But um, yeah, we're, we're very, we're very hands off. Um, uh, and I think we put in some minor edits for these six books we put out last year, and we're doing another six books this year, and I think it's normally, like unless there's something uh, very confusing or kind of egregious uh, morally. <laughs> I, I wouldn't step in there, I think. Um, but yeah, I, as I, like, our role as publisher, I feel like we're trying to build a middle step between zines and graphic novels as like a stepping stone thing as well. Because I feel like there's not enough of that. So, and there's a reason that a lot of people don't kind of, especially in Australia, there's, there's, there's nothing like that. So um, we were trying to get kind of zines into bookstores, was a lot of the original kind of push for us. So. Um, yeah, we did some, with some stores. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. You might say that like there's a strong voice in the in your comics, and like you can feel the personality of each artist in your books in a very strong way. Like, Mystical Boy Scout is like a super uncompromising, hilarious. And then. And then, but similarly, Bailey Sharp's book, which is my favorite of her whole line, is um, uh, so, it's, it's a very strong voice, but it's very restrained mm -hmm. and mysterious and enigmatic mm -hmm. in the way that, that she presents things. And I like that there's not a huge through line from book to book other than this kind of, kind of set of your use of color and that everyone had like a really strong individual voice, but in terms of genre and subject, there's something for everyone. Yeah, there's really no, yeah, it's a very, it's, it's, it's very hard to pin down. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, mm. All right, let's, let's go to Pa. So the same question, your, your personal and aesthetic vision. And uh, I'm very especially curious to see, since you've been doing this for such a long time, how that vision has evolved over time. Well, that's a good question. <clears throat> I'm asking myself that very often. <laughs> um, just to go a little back to, to what you said, uh, if uh, I'm hands off or hands off, uh, it also depends on the uh, the artist 
who contact me. Either it is a new talent uh, who haven't uh, haven't been published anything, uh, or it, it is an experienced artist who I maybe have published five books. So I rely on him, trust him, and when he delivers his uh, artwork, I'm pretty hands off. But if it's a um, newcomer then I maybe go into details and work with him. And another thing is also that um, some artists would like to be edited. Uh, and other artists, they, they are very... Uh, they don't want to tell uh, what, is, what their next work is about until they've actually completely finished with it. Uh, so it, it uh, it's depends uh, on how off or on I am. Um, and uh, my vision, uh, of course, it's it's my own taste, but I'm also uh, take a look at the artwork and say, okay, is there a market for it? For it? Um, would any, anybody buy it? Because somebody has to buy the book so we can get some uh, money, and, yeah, earn some money from it. So it's uh, I, I I can't give, give a, a clear answer on, on that. I'm also curious because you. Uh you publish, um, you know, f for example, you publish Lenny's Reggae's work, and uh, it's clear in terms of taste that you give others a lot of leeway because this is a really in your face book, and her work in general is very like, provocative. Um, do you find that, that there's a marketplace for this kind of book in Denmark? Is this something, or is this a difficult sell? Uh, in Denmark, there's also a, 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 a was called a, a, a. There's also a lot of interest in in the feminism and the ide sexual identities, uh, and I, I would like to be part of that movement also. So, when Enrico Enrico she pitches me this uh, this uh, book, I said actually said yes because I would also like to uh, be a voice in that uh, in that uh, movement. So. Um, this book is actually pretty hands-off, but uh, Rigge is also an experienced artist, so I rely on her. Um, so you do print a lot of stuff from, uh, from, from Denmark and Scandinavia in general, um, but I'm also curious, you print, you have books published from other languages uh, that you publish. What a, it, again, is what you choose to publish just a personal, it's the same kind of balance. And um, are there books that you've brought over <clears throat> that surprised you in one way or another from other countries, both either, wow, this sold a lot better than I thought, or I thought this would do really well in Denmark? Well, <clears throat> I have a lot of experience where I'm very positive, and then it's a complete flop. So. <laughs> Uh, but the, uh, to my luck, also it goes also the other way around. Um, I, ten years ago, I published a Japanese artist called Jiro Taniguchi, uh, and uh, I just hoped that uh, he could find an audience in Denmark. And to my luck, it found a very big audience. So yes, it's um, and it was my personal taste that uh, which made me decide to put him out because I really think he's a great, great artist. So, yeah. 30% uh, markets and 70% uh, personal taste, more or less. That's a good, that's a good ratio, that makes sense. And uh, now we come to Pranila, and um, I know that your primary role is as an editor, as part of the publishing house, but it seems very clear that you have a very strong influence on what you're publishing in this particular regard. So, um, <clears throat> again, as, as an editor, what's your vision? And as someone who's trying to like grow the market in a lot of books that are extremely personal and challenging, like, uh, is, it a, is it Ida or Ida? It's Ida. Ida, okay. Uh, you know, a book like that. So just, just kind of the same question. And you are an editor, and what's your technique? What's your approach? Well, I, I would say, as uh, I said before, that my goal is to, to get the comic, comic out to more people. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually really hands-on to, to help that process. Um, not that all pieces of works need that, but um, 
it can be necessary. And uh, with uh, Ida, for example, she's a debutant, um, and uh, I find her story important. Uh, it's a young adult uh, about uh, being alone and making a friendship, technology, bullying. So, um, and Ida was uh, not an experienced artist uh, within comics, so we had a really fine process of, of improving what she already made. Um, so, but uh, also uh, the way I work with this, this is not, has not come out yet. Again, um, I want to um, uh, enlarge the market, so uh, I, I take uh, an established writer for this piece, and uh, I put him together with a young debutant, and um, it has been a, quite a creative and wonderful process. So, um, and uh, and also in regards of uh, uh, the art, uh, I do not have to love the art. <laughs> I have to love the story and the narrative, because you can have, you know, uh, for example, maybe someone will be angry with me, but the, the Swedish comics, they, they have a tradition of drawing kind of uh, not pretty, not, not correct, not naturalistic. So someone would say this is not, this is ugly, but it is, but lots of it uh, works anyway. So it's, it's how it works. That's uh, what I'm going for. <laughs> yeah. and, and what's interesting is that you talk about story, but, um, <clears throat> You know, and, and visually, Ida's book is really, uh, it's very challenging. And uh, when you talk about the way art, does it have to work at least in a way that carries a narrative, even if the way it does it is like more poetic and not direct? Mm -hmm. And I know that um, Emile's work in particular is very strange. Page. It's, it's really wild. It's kind of psychedelic, actually, <laughs> and I'm really uh, excited to how, how, how it's uh, going to be read. Um, yeah. So, as long as you feel like you as an editor can follow the narrative, even if the narrative doesn't hand everything over to the reader and make it easy, as long as it's there, that's something as an editor that you're fine with. Yeah, and this piece, which has not come out. It's a very demanding piece, you know, you have to work as a reader, but, you know, that's good. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, that's uh, also the idea of uh, making comics, of course. Indeed. So I wanted to ask a practical question. Um, I'm curious to see how things differ. Is, um, in your own individual countries, um, and what difficulties do you encounter as a publisher in ways you're to your country? And what kind of support at a government level is there for publishing in your country? And um, I'll start with the most depressing answer, which is Carta. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the challenges we we are running into some challenges, uh, specifically because I'm interested in publishing straightforward pornography. Um, that's something that I've wanted to do for a bit, and I feel like I'm in a position to do it. And also, like, there's not a lot of good queer, like, pornography being published in print right now. Um, I'm very uninterested in, like, most of the stuff that's coming out. So, um, Within the U.S., uh, finding a credit card provider who is willing to accept payments for pornographic materials is very difficult. Um, they take a higher percentage. They require a lot of background checks. Um, I'm having like an inspector coming to my house to make sure that we have a home office and we're not like some sort of shell company. Wow. Um, and like I've had to like get my personal credit checked and like all of this wild stuff that these hoops you have to jump through because like the alternative is processing payments for pornography through someone like Shopify payments or PayPal but like at that point you're risking having all of your assets not only shut down but seized um, and that's not like something I, I want to deal with on a governmental level like I suppose there are grants that I could theoretically be applying for on like maybe a state level but 
given even aside from like the desire to publish pornography the fact that like what we do are like short runs of like transsexual art comics that like tend to be very focused on like trauma and the body it's difficult for us to pitch grants to people who are looking for like uplifting stories about entrepreneurship in Detroit or whatever you know like um we have not received any governmental support, and I think we're unlikely to. Um, I would be genuinely shocked. Um, and, you know, if we wanted to get it, we would have to jump through some really absurd hoops. Um, and that's also something that I'm not, like, terribly willing to do. Like, I don't want to give editorial power to anybody over our stories for the sake of, like, having some money. You know, like, part of the reason we do risograph printing is that it's inexpensive, relatively speaking. So I would rather have little money and, like, work sort of within our means to publish whatever we want than, like, have to deal with the, like, nightmare tangle of grant-writing bureaucracy in the United States. Andy, please talk about grant-writing bureaucracy in the United States. Well, <laughs> this is one thing I won't miss when I leave. There are uh, um, publishing grants available to you that can be quite lucrative if you do everything right. If you print pamphlet comics, if you print other books and zines that are possibly fancy and wonderful, but they don't have a spine. If you don't have four Canadian artists each year in your roster, brand new book in the calendar year, you will get nothing. Mm -hmm. I did all of those things, and I continue to do some of those things, because I don't like anybody to be the boss of me, particularly somebody, although it's irksome when you're paying a lot of tax in our country. Uh, you know, it's great, we have health care and whatever, but you know, that's not free. We pay high taxes for this. I don't um, begrudge that one second, especially someone with chronic illness. But um, if you do things right, if you do it right from the beginning, it can be very lucrative. Um, Drawn and Quarterly were able to get a separate grant in order to open a retail store, which is fabulous. Uh, at that time, Montreal was a cheaper city to live in, but you know, there is, it doesn't just have to be for book publishing. So again, if you follow the rules from the beginning, you know, if you don't come to publishing from outer space like I did, not knowing <laughs> any of this stuff until way too late, I could have been getting a lot more grant money. Uh, because I worked in advertising in a job I didn't care for for a lot of years, but was very lucrative, uh, it supported me being able to publish the stuff that I want. So. Um, you know, do they all sell a lot? No, not, not, I mean, even Michael DeForge and Jesse Jacobs in the early days, people would come by and if you're used to, uh, I don't know, Charlie Brown, fabulous. But if you pick up, you know, Michael and, you know, the face is like peeling off and they're horrified. I've had people sort of go, like, <laughs> right at the table. Some of them, you know, calm down and then they will buy it. But a lot of them are like, what even is this? So um, the challenge for me is to A, grow our audience, that's a separate question. And also to get people who, you know, may be read to as kids, may be introduced to comics when they're little, to jump over to the weirder side of stuff, to understand, have people introduce to them that the kind of stuff that I publish is, you can read the uh, mainstream stuff also, and there's middle stuff, and then there's, you know, weird stuff, but there's no reason why anybody can't read all of those. You know, there's room for whatever, so. I just need you to know that our little corner, be it niche, very niche sometimes, does exist. And if you get into it, you might really, really like it. Thank you. So Mark, what about you in Australia? Um, I feel like it's a similar, probably a similar landscape to Canada uh, in Australia. But there, there are just a lot of people, a lot of really amazing arts organizations competing for a very small amount of money is basically the way uh, it works. And I think we applied for four grants uh, over the last year to come here um, and do this. And um, we didn't get any of them, you know, <laughs> that's fine. Um, but I, like, yeah, so uh, I feel like there's, I, um, yeah, it's also we've had like conservative governments for like year after year and there's been like arts funding cuts after arts funding cuts kind of things. And um, ballet does very well, opera does very well, the conservative arts do great. Uh, and uh, finally, um, more uh, like kind of glove, but you know, comics you could read in high gloves, and uh, <laughs> um, but I don't know. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't want to uh, bemoan it. I, I feel like there's also a, there's, there's this whole thing like when you apply for arts funding, you have to be able to prove that you could pay for it anyway, which is the most like <laughs> far out. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. But that's the, yeah. that's also the, the reporting thing. process yeah. afterwards. Is yeah. it's honestly, you, there's no lying. I feel like one of those, you know, the IRS people for you or CRA is going to come to my house and go through every yes. single mm -hmm. thing in my fridge if I do it wrong. So <laughs> and then the I'll be penalized because they won't give it to me next time. So there's that. There's yeah. money available, but boy, do they make you dance for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so we're applying for some money for next year's books, but I think we're just uh, going forward as if we're not going to get that money. But. Yeah, yeah. You always can apply, I guess. A lot of, I have a lot of friends who get grants who are always like, you got to apply for grants, it's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's lovely to hear, but it's extremely frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you to come up here. And Paul, what about, I'm, I'm very curious about what it's like in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Russia. Now listen. <laughs> Um, you can get grants, and uh, you have to support me here, Penilla. Um, I think you should start with the place where you can do the grant thing. Okay. Because uh, the, the, the comics in Denmark, they are very stigmatized and as associated with children. So uh, the, 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 the common public thinks it's for children. The book keeper or book uh, stores uh, thinks it's for children. And uh, the journalist also thinks it's for children. So this is like the, f the, f the first uh, breach, or what you call it, we have to struggle with. Mm -hmm. And then you can go on with the funding. You're not, you're not agreeing? Why did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but, uh, but it, that's right what Penelope said, but I feel at the moment that uh, there's uh, the, the, the Minister of Culture, they have some, uh, they think at the moment that there's a boom in uh, graphic novels in Denmark and uh, we of course tell them that there is. Uh, so they, um, they are pretty much willing to uh, s uh, give uh, uh, or sponsor uh, both artists so they can get a, a, a working uh, sponsorship uh, and also they can also if they are very lucky or very talented get a three years uh, sponsorship where they get three every every year in, in, over the three years they get an um, annual salary so they can uh, in peace work with their next uh, book uh, but that, it's not uh, everybody it, maybe it's uh, every five years there's a comic book artist who get that uh, then you as a publisher you can get uh, grants for uh, production and printing uh, and you can also, um, for example, if you want to publish a Norwegian graphic novel, you can get you can get grants from the Norwegian uh, Minister of Culture and also from the French, uh, or, yeah, the French Minister of Culture. So there's actually a lot of programs in um, the, all these European welfare system. So, um, but as this is said. Um, the print run in Denmark, because we are only six million people, which is like a state here in the, in the US, um, the print run for the books are so small, so even that the artists and the publishers are, are able to get grants, um, we're not rich. Uh, artists still need to have other jobs, and uh, me as a publisher, I also, also have a, another job to, to survive. So. Um, even if it sounds like a heaven for you, it's, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, that's true. You can also, I, I have a couple of times used uh, private uh, fundraisers. So that can, I don't know how that works here. And then uh, I've done uh, two uh, Kickstarter campaigns. Mm -hmm. You have this uh, Christmas bestiary was uh, Kickstarted, which is, uh, ensures a pre-sale and uh, and also, it's a very good way to make uh, noise about what's mm -hmm. going on. So, yeah. That's very interesting because I know a lot of <coughs> Americans in particular think of Europe being more civilized in that way and having lots of money for the arts. And I'm, I was curious about how it varies from country to country. Because I know I've heard that Germany gives more money to artists and that um, 
not even for specific projects, but like, we'll give you this much money a month, and you can live on that and make it hard. Um, with regard to things uh, related to the bottom line, how much money you make, uh, we're here at the Small Press Expo. I'm curious for each publisher, how important are shows like this to your bottom line of how much money you make? Uh, and we'll go ahead and put a card in and keep going down the line. I, hmm, pretty important, I guess. Uh, it's a recent thing for me to actually even break even at a show. Like, until recently, shows were expensive vacations for me, you know, like, functionally. Um, but at this point, we we do break even, and we, we make money. Um, I would say shows are important for, for other reasons, you know, in terms of building audience and getting exposure for our artists and, like, that kind of thing. Um, but we also, you know, we do pretty good sales, um, and it's good for uh, consumers because they don't have to pay shipping costs, especially if they're international. Um, I would say, like, for our press, bottom line is sort of a weird question anyway, because my goal is, is very much not to make a lot of money, um, so much as it is to, like, not lose money, you know? Um, the payment structure we have set up with our artists is... I mean, I'll just tell you, um, uh, my accountant hates this, um, but I, yeah, <laughs> um, I, I do like a straight 50% split with our artists and I don't prorate our materials. So all of the printing costs, me paying my employee, show fees, everything comes out of my half and then the other half goes straight to the artist. So if a book is $9, they get four fifty a book. If I wholesale the book, they get 50% of whatever we wholesaled it for. Um, and, like, that does not leave a lot for a profit. Like, we make a few hundred dollars on every print run, but it's important to me, like, that the artists are actually getting something tangible out of it. Because when I started in comics, my first book was $8, and I got 80 cents per book. And I knew that they had published or printed 400 copies, so I was looking at it like, okay, I could make up to... 300 whatever dollars and that's ridiculous you know it's not worth it for me as an artist so like it's very important to me like in my capacity as like again like a quote stepping stone publisher to make it like at least somewhat worthwhile for my artists and like with the money that we make from Disquette I was able to fly um, Elliot G out to the show from Los Angeles and like pay for their hotel room and everything so like um, we do okay, but, like, it, I would say, like, what I'm mostly concerned about is, like, not actively going into debt and, like, just, um, sort of sustaining enough that we can continue to do, like, the work that we're doing. Yeah. That's not a sustainable model, however. Without, that worries me because, uh, you know, one thing is as you start to grow your people, you want to work with them again and up it every time, and if you are... If you're, well, at some point, a distributor will come to you, and then you don't have to change your game the way I did, if you want to make it more sustainable, but anyway, it's a different conversation after yeah. the show. Um, I don't, <laughs> shows for me are about bringing the artist. If you get into the um, grant system in Canada, there are three levels, and if you get into the big one, and Canada Council gives you money, that affords you the opportunity to then apply for travel grants, for translation grants, if I want to buy one of your books and do it. I have uh, funding to hire a translator, to you know, even possibly print it. Until you get into that, which takes years, uh, you're on your, you cannot apply to help your artists fly from whatever. I don't just work with local artists, so uh, I'm, you know, Ben Passmore is here from Philly. I live in Toronto. Uh, Connor Wilson is in Montreal. Um, you know, I'm always flying people in, but I want them to meet their fans. I want to introduce them to people. I want to see people interact with them when they see the actual book. Uh, it's pretty fantastic and rewarding in a way that you know you can't measure by money. But you do have to be practical. So, because once you get a big distributor, um, you know. I don't love it, but a lot of people will buy the book on Amazon. People will come at any single show, take a picture of the book, 
and then go home and buy it cheaper. If you cannot afford a book, if you don't live near a local bookstore, I would never fault you. I would still rather you buy the book than not buy the book. I, my art still gets a royalty wherever you buy it from. But, you know, you, I think we all contribute when we do that to, uh, you know, bad things happening to our business, the industry as a whole. And if we don't address those little things, I think cumulatively we lose more stores and that kind of thing. So, um, I, you know, I, do we break even? Sometimes. It's a lot of trouble for me. But it's not that important. I like Carta. We come from the same mindset, you know. Uh, our accountants don't like us. But, <laughs> but we're not doing it for our accountants. And so we're doing it for the artists. And so it may not be the best business model, but it's still important to come. I enjoy doing shows also because I get to meet all the people who buy our books and, you know, thank them in person. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, shows are more. I feel like we, in Australia, it's very different because we don't really have shows like this, or if there are shows, there are no shows like this for independent comics. There are a lot of shows like this for like, um, mainstream comics. And then the shows that we go to are all zine fairs, and like table fees at zine fairs are like $15 to $20. So it's very, it's like a different climate for uh, financially to, to have those get into those places. But um, uh, like, I think we always build a work around these shows because they're the most. It's the most like kind of rewarding and exciting way to release a book because you get to meet all these people and you get to like look at people who are going to read this book and or these books and yeah um, so they're important in that way definitely financially it's not necessarily the same like I feel like the same we do the same like 50 50 split with our artists as well um, and we did a bunch of contributor copies as well but we're changing it because we're doing another six books and we realized that we have no money for paper. <laughs> It's important to buy. Yeah. Yeah. The price. Yeah. yeah oh yes. Tariffs, yes. Um, so we're changing it to sixty forty for new ones. <laughs> um, but so we can buy paper next time. And if we wanted to, because we had to do reprints to come here, um, and so that was uh, financially. Ideally, we would have had money from selling the first books, but we broke even on everything, um, which was great. And like that's all we really like. We're just trying to make these nice books as well. So um, like I, I don't know. I. It's not, uh, it's what we do with most of our time. <laughs> but it's like Michael works in a, a noodle store, makes these amazing noodles. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I, uh, I do, I draw like Garth Manson comics and um, we've just had two other people come on board, um, Ben Jules and Bailey Sharp, um, and they both work in kind of academia. Um, and so uh, we're kind of all using it as a, yeah. Um, to, yeah. Sorry. All right, what about, um what about you, Paul? Uh, I, I completely agree with you that uh, th these shows are very, very important because you are, you meet your reader yeah. directly, uh, and then you crawl back to your basement <laughs> and get depressed that you can't sell, sell any books, and the journalists are ignoring you, and the bookstores are ignoring you. But these these uh, these shows are fuel for you to. Go on, keep on, don't don't uh, lose your um, your energy or your uh, your um, mood. Uh, so so that's also very important for me as a publisher. And I also think the artists who um, are meeting the, the readers. Yes. So for all the same reasons as you have already said, uh, and again Denmark is very small, so we have very few of these uh, gatherings, but uh, I would like to add that we, we it's also important for us to attend at the more literary uh, festivals, again to reach uh, other readers than the, the regular comic book reader, so this is something that we really focus on to bring comics to, yeah, to literary festivals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have time for one question, maybe more two. Uh, there's mics on either side, if anyone wants to ask a question. Go ahead. Hello. Um, so I, my question is regarding money also. I feel with uh, small press, especially when you're starting out, that is a big question. Um, I kind of want to ask you silly, but if you don't want to say specifically, that's fine. But I'm wondering, uh, what is the amount where you feel you're comfortable enough where you say, okay, I'm ready to smart start a press and we're comfortable like taking on artists and sustaining them? 
So I feel like that's like, as someone who's also interested in possibly doing publishing one day, I'm like, I always see these publishers and I'm like, it seems like they had seed money at some point. How much was that? I have no idea. I mean, uh, speaking as like maybe the freshest publisher here, I, I don't know how, way. yeah, right, in every, <laughs> the freshest. <laughs> um, <laughs> I did not have seed money. Like, when I started the press, like, I was thousands of dollars in credit card debt. I still am. Like, but what has worked for me more than anything is I got um, an accountant who works with small businesses, and I got a business bank account that is completely separate from my personal finances. So despite whatever's going on in my personal life or, you know, like, whatever dumb shit I'm buying and... It doesn't actually affect the the small press. I'm able to like have a very clear handle on like how much money do we have in this account at any time, and that informs a lot of my um, decisions. Also, like I, there's so much boring stuff you have to do when you're running a press that I hate. Um, I am bad at math. I'm bad at mental math. I am a cartoonist for a reason. Like I don't have an interest in accounting or tax law or whatever. But like what I try to do is have like very clear spreadsheets and like a sense of like where I am with like my artist royalty payments and things. And like I guess the people I'm working with are also understanding that like um, I haven't missed any payments, but like I'm trying to move to like a quarterly model so that I don't always have to be like hyper conscious of exactly how much money we have in the bank account. Like it's nice to be able to like dip into um, the money that eventually will go to royalties to pay for something now so that like when we recoup it later, you know, it, it's not a big deal. Um, I would say more than anything, like if you want to break into publishing, um, start small, you know, like start with... Run. Yeah. <laughs> Like, start with one artist or two artists, and that's what we did. And, like, we're able to do 18 books this time, God help us, because, um, like, we've built up. And, like, also, we're, I'm bad at saying no. And, like, I, every person I see who I like, I'm like, you should do a book with us now, you know, immediately. Um, you know, if you have the capacity and the space and the time, like, you can do it. Because, like, if you're not giving out advances and you have, like, a, a, a split set up with your artist, you know, like, you, once the book is sold, then they have the money, you know? Um, as long as you're able to buy the materials ahead of time, like your paper, your ink, or however you're printing it, like, that's the big hurdle. And then, aside from that, like, you're a publisher, you know? like it. It's unfortunately not hard to get into this trap that we all find ourselves in. <laughs> it really is. I guess we started as a printer, so like we like just started printing other people's work for kind of friends' work and then other people's work, and so that um, was, you know, we ended up with a lot of ink <laughs> because of that, and we were printing, and now we're printing every now and then we get cords for like people like, who run wine bars <laughs> uh, and they want to print their wine. Anyway, I don't, um, but uh, yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a dangerous game. It is. <laughs> it it is a dangerous, dangerous game. But uh, I, I appreciate, and I know everybody else appreciates all your willingness to put so much of your time, resources, and emotional energy into this. And uh, we need to wrap up the panel. I want to thank all of our publishers uh, for being on this panel and discussing so many details. And uh, please do visit all of their tables. And I just want to add one last personal note in uh, thanking Amy for everything she's done for not just everyone in comics, but me personally over the years. And she's carried on this tradition. Um, Amy will be you know, leaving publishing in the next year or so. And what she leaves is a legacy of how to do things right, how to give advice to other people, how to care for other people. And as someone who's followed comics for a long time, people like you will always come along. Um, and I feel like people like Carta is, in a sense, a successor in that sense. And Carta is going to be providing an example. Because I know Annie learned from the great Dylan Williams, who also provided uh, 
the, but the example of spark plug as as an ethical. Yeah, I, I think no one at this table is here for the money. I mean, yeah. we would like to all make more money doing this. We would like to make money, period. But we're all doing it for love, and it's a hell of a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of thankless hours. You know, um, you know, the publicity stuff may seem glamorous and that kind of thing. If you were on the other end, you know, we work <laughs> for you. But uh, I haven't taken a cent out of my company in 13 years. I've had any profit I put back in, so I can do another book. I can pay a higher advance. Uh, I can send somebody to a European show that I can get no grant for, or you know that kind of thing. Or I can support an artist who you know fell off their bike and broke their face okay. because right. he's one of my roster. So um, you know you can make your own model. That's the good thing. Okay. If you're small and you don't have you know some big boss and like layers of bureaucracy to cut through, I think we have to stop. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.